okay, I guess now we can start. So it's a pleasure to have uh, this week uh, here uh, Jesse Thaler from MIT. Jesse is uh, an expert in uh, collider physics and machine learning, uh, and uh, he's also one of the organizers, uh, the uh, international organizer of uh, this workshop. So it's uh, good to have him here, and uh, I hope that uh, you will find uh, uh, what he will say very interesting, and also that you can interact with him uh, in the period where he's here. So uh, please, uh, you can go with the talk. And uh, so, of course, this is very informal as all the other talks. So if you want to ask questions, just uh, raise your hand, and we will try to give you the microphone this time, because the other times it didn't work so well. OK. okay. Well, thanks very much. Uh, indeed, I'm an organizer for this workshop on machine learning at GGI, but I feel a little bit like an organizer in name only, uh, in part because I was on vacation on the beach last week, and uh, I have to go back to MIT next week to teach. So I'm only here for four days, but I look forward to interacting with all of you. Um, so I was asked to give a kind of overview talk about machine learning for high energy physics. Um, I have another slide deck if people want to hear more specifics about some of the research that I've been doing. Um, but this is an opportunity for me to uh, reuse some slides that I made as part of the decadal snowmass process in the United States. So um, as you know, uh, or as you may know, uh, every some number of years, you know, on the roughly 10 year time scale, the US particle physics community comes in together and discusses what the latest greatest ideas are and what the opportunities for the future are. And I participated as part of the theory frontier, trying to assert that theoretical physics was an essential part of the high energy physics endeavor. And you can ask me a bit more about why it's so important to advocate for theory specifically um, as, a, as a separate entity in the US high energy physics program. And so I was asked to give various talks about theoretical physics, uh, phenomenology, but also about machine learning. And so I, made these slide decks while sitting on the beach last week, which is basically just I copy and pasted slides that I made from February, March of 2022. And I realized that my slides are already out of date, so I apologize for that. And then also, this is kind of a high level overview talk where the attended audience was that of machine learning skeptics. And because you're here in this audience, that's not really you. So there's going to be some content here that's uh, trying to convince people about the value of machine learning for high energy physics, which hopefully all of you are uh, convinced of already to some degree. Um, but I hope that the slides I present will spark some discussion, and I'm happy to go into more detail on anything. And again, if you'd like to hear about more of the specific things that I've been thinking about lately, um, we can <laughs> switch to an entirely different slide deck and talk about that. But I wanted to uh, give you some sense of an overview, which I think will fit into some of the talks that you're going to be hearing uh, later this week. So one of the things that I, I should do, uh, this is now my responsibility as director of a new National Science Foundation funded uh, artificial intelligence institute, the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. And uh, I'm the director of this venture. Uh, it was started at the kind of end of 2020, <laughs> at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, and in the Boston area, uh, four universities, MIT, Northeastern, Harvard, and Tufts coming together bringing together the computer science community and the physics community to try to simultaneously advance physics knowledge from the smallest building blocks of nature to the largest structures in the universe and galvanize AI research innovation at the same time. And so there are 25 uh, faculty in the Boston area pursuing this with roughly 75 uh, postdocs and um, uh, uh, grad students uh, doing this research. And though I forgot to put this on the slide, we have a postdoctoral fellowship program. If you know of anyone who's at that career stage or you're at that career stage where you're looking for a postdoc position where you can be an I-5 fellow to work at the intersection of these, these various fields. And one way of trying to describe what we're doing at this AI Institute is trying to infuse physics intelligence into artificial intelligence. So taking all the tools that we already use as, as physicists and in particular high energy physics and incorporate them into uh, AI and machine learning methodologies. And I'll highlight some of these in this talk today, things like incorporating symmetry structures into your uh, machine learning, uh, guarantees of exactness, uh, uncertainty quantification. These are the types of things that as physicists we think are really important. And we think that we can build AI tools to incorporate those. Now, when you talk to someone about infusing physics intelligence and artificial intelligence, um, one of the first things that comes up is this. Uh, this is a uh, article in the New York Times by Dennis Overby uh, in November of 2020, around the time that our AI Institute was, was founded. And I'm quoted in this article where 
you know, there's a speculation about whether a computer could devise a theory of everything. Um, you know, whether computers might replace, uh, uh, you know, human physicists. Could a, a computer come up with the structures and, uh, and symmetries of quantum field theory? And, you know, this type of question is one that I get asked a lot by people who don't know much about what AI really is. And at one level, I kind of loathe this question. So at one level, it's kind of overhyping deep learning. I mean, <laughs> deep learning is just you know one of many algorithmic tools that we can use for data analysis. Um, it's a, just one of many computa computational strategies relevant for the physical sciences and relevant for high energy physics. So you know you see this kind of neural network trying to represent some kind of blobby looking scientist, um, mm. and you know it's kind of maddening uh, to to think oh what some computer algorithm that's just trying to minimize some loss function is ever going to replace what we do in, in physics, theoretical or experimental. Um, but on the other hand, I kind of love this question um, because it reframes the scientific process and raises questions about what aspects of our reductionist logic that we use could be automated. Um, if you think about the successes of the standard model of particle physics, how much of that was kind of a brute force exhaustive search through the space of all underlying theories that could describe the data that we see. Um, and certainly my own opinion has changed about the relevance of this type of logic that is a logic of searching a giant space of possible answers using machine learning as an algorithm to uh, search out those answers. And you know, I don't know what the answer to this question, could a computer devise a theory of everything, but it seems pretty clear to me that AI is here to stay and the type of logic that one uses in AI is, is going to continue to be relevant in high energy physics. Now, there's various reasons to be skeptical. So, you know, how could a machine possibly outcompete a century of triumphs in theoretical physics? So this is a plot showing all the various particles in the standard model when they were predicted theoretically, when they were discovered experimentally, and in most cases, the theory uh, preceded the experimental uh, uh, discovery. And you know, we have a time-honored tradition of doing this, most famously with the Higgs boson most recently. Why do we think that an AI type strategy or a data science type strategy could outcompete this type of logic? Um, of course, then you go to other examples, like for example, you know, the rise of chess players where, you know, there was a time period where not necessarily with, with uh, machine intelligence, but various uh, strategies started to outconform humans. And then when you start to get into the kind of uh, alpha uh, uh, zero uh, era, where you see the top computers are way outperforming our strategies in part because they're finding uh, different types of strategies than humans would devise. But, but, you know, in these examples, you know, these are games. These are games with a precise meaning to success and amenable to brute force search. And partly why I love and loathe this question about whether a human could ever be replaced by a machine in terms of theoretical physics is, well, is it true whether we have a precise meaning to success for discovering a new particle, a precise meaning for success for doing a precision calculation, a precise meaning of success when it comes to coming up with the physical laws, and is it possible that it's amenable to brute force search? Could you imagine a brute force search through the space of possible physical uh, theories, possibly with the help of something like symbolic regression? Could you actually do a brute force search? And you know, maybe there is a way of doing that uh, with these techniques. And there's also reasons to be wary uh, of the overhyping of um, of machine learning and AI techniques. This is uh, not, not coming from the physics community. This is coming from uh, uh, the, uh, a, a study uh, commissioned by the Social and Ethical Responsibilities of Computing Group uh, at MIT. And this is a, a, by my MIT colleagues developing a framework to understanding unintended consequences of machine learning. In this case, unintended consequences is something that we as physicists might call uh, appropriately quantifying systematic uncertainties or biases. Um, and I, I'm not going to go through this, this slide in any detail, but it's going through in a social science context, um, all the various ways that you can get into trouble with either the way you've accumulated the data, the assumptions that you're making about the data, the way that you're deploying machine learning, in all ways where the outcome might not be desirable. And we do have to be careful um, as we uh, start to Deploying these type of techniques in the scientific domain, that the scientific analog of these uh, social issues don't come back to bite us <laughs> and end up uh, undoing some of the scientific successes that we've already had with more traditional methods. Okay, 
So with that preamble, um, the perspective that I presented as part of the snow mass process and wanted to advocate for, and I'm advocating for here, is that my sense is that high energy physics has been irreversibly impacted by the rise of deep learning. It's kind of hard to imagine not continuing to develop these techniques going forward. Now the buzz is around AI, but I think that's actually, in some sense, missing the point a bit. Um, AI is just one of many computational strategies, and I feel like we should leverage analysis strategies from various areas of mathematics, statistics, and computer science. So I'll give you some other uh, examples that aren't exactly machine learning or deep learning in the way that we usually think about it, but have a similar uh, flavor to them in that they are computational strategies that uh, leverage uh, data in interesting ways. And then, you know, the opportunity, okay, maybe not developing a theory of everything, but we do have an opportunity to translate aspects of high energy physics uh, into a computational language. Uh, and that's something where um, I hope we have a chance to discuss more of this uh, this week. You know, what aspects of what we do could be described uh, in a more brute force search type of way, uh, outlining a space of possibilities that then are um, uh, searched for through some optimization strategies. And I do think that there's things in high energy physics that can uh, fall in that in that in that uh, domain. Um, and again, this is this is from the Snowmass talk. So I have citations in this talk. They're kind of representative of what's going on. They're not exhaustive. And they're also, again, six months out of date. So apologies for that. OK, so I'm going to go through these in, uh, in, in order. But actually, before I do that, um, for those of you who haven't already thought about machine learning in this language, um, I'm going to talk about what it took for me to kind of make my brain switch um, from the type of uh, research that I was doing previously to a more machine learning bent on the, on the things that I do and try to answer this question of what formalisms are needed to leverage ML for high energy physics theory or high energy physics experiment or really any scientific domain. And what was the kind of switch for me that made it possible to think in this, in this language. Um, and I'll, I'm going to do this through uh, a very well-known example of an optimization strategy that's known as the likelihood ratio trick, which is a way of using machine learning to learn a particular function of interest. Um, so I'm gonna first describe it in the statistics language and then describe it again in the physics language. And it's when I saw the physics equation that my, my, my brain flipped <laughs> into thinking that this is the right way of, of conceptualizing certain problems. Okay, so um, this is an example that goes under the name of simulation-based inference, or sometimes known as likelihood-free um, uh, methods. But the goal here is to estimate the ratio of two probability densities, P of X divided by Q of X. Why would you want to estimate likelihood ratios? Well, there's various likelihood-based strategies for searching for new phenomena uh, or uh, inferring parameters uh, that we might want to use. And they're typically based on having in hand some kind of approximation to a likelihood ratio. We want to do this with machine learning. So we're going to have some training data. We're going to have finite samples uh, of drawn from P of X capital P and drawn from Q of X capital Q. And we're going to have some kind of learnable function, some f of x parameterized, for example, by, by neural networks. Um, it could be parameterized by some other way. It could be parameterized as a linear function uh, in linear regression, could be parameterized by some symbolic regression. That doesn't matter so much. But we're going to have a loss functional where we're going to take the expectation value over these samples. So these are samples where I'm drawing uh, values of x. And I'm going to take the average of log of this function f and uh, over the samples P and take the average of F minus one over the samples Q. Um, and uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, Andrea and, and, and Rafael, I, I learned this, this particular loss functional from your paper, though we had a, uh, an exponential, this is the log version of think of what, what you wrote. Um, and then what you're gonna do is you're going to optimize over the space of all possible Fs, um, optimize this, uh, this loss functional. And so asymptotically, that means if you had infinite training data, perfectly flexible f of x, and uh, you didn't get stuck in some kind of local minimum, um, you can show that this uh, uh, minimum uh, occurs when f of x takes the value of this likelihood ratio. And the actual value of the minimum is a statistical divergence, the, the KL divergence, which appears oftentimes in statistical analysis. OK, so this is the way that this is often presented. and you know, I said, you can show that. And 
that somehow as a physicist, well, no, show me the manipulation that you could do to show this. And it's often uh, shown in a, in a more complicated way than I'm going to show you on the next slide. But once you kind of realize that this loss functional, I mean, this is written in, in statistics notation, can be translated to a more physics friendly notation. This type of optimization problem is basically just the same thing as Lagrangian mechanics, where we have an action uh, and we have our Lagrangian instead of a Lagrangian that's a function of t, it's a function in this case of the features x. And the Lagrangian that we have, we have that log and we have that log of f and that f minus one. And then what am I integrating over? I'm integrating over my sample. So I have my probability density p and my probability density q. And all you have to do is solve the Euler Lagrange equations. And the solution, which you can kind of do even in your head of doing this functional integration, is what you want. And then you realize, oh, wait a second. All the statistics stuff here, if I go asymptotically, that is when I can replace these expectation values by just continuous integrals over probability densities, it becomes something that, again, takes this more Lagrangian form, and I can use familiar techniques from physics to, to, to figure out what it's supposed to do. And then you realize, oh, wait, now you have freedom, a lot of freedom, to define, at least asymptotically, what are structures whose answer will be the solution to an Euler Lagrange equation. And it's shifting your focus from solving problems to specifying problems in terms of something to be optimized and then finding that optimum. Now there's a challenge, of course, the challenge is that is buried in this word that I use this asymptotically. Of course, in real life, we only have finite samples. You have to worry about whether when you do this, whether there's any um, offset or bias from, from doing this approach. Also, it's not true that um, all the best and greatest machine learning uh, loss functions can be written in this Lagrangian form. And there's certain ones that actually in a physics language would be non-local expressions that you're trying to optimize. But the, the point that I want to make here and the, and the thing that, that kind of flipped a switch in my brain is is that oh wait i get to specify the problem it's not the computer that i'm that i'm offloading some tasks to i get to specify what's the thing that i want to optimize um what is the uh uh system of equations that i want to solve i can even specify the way that i want to solve those systems of equations um so people have uh, developed different methods of doing instead of gradient descent uh, some more complicated uh, uh update steps that are actually based on uh, taking the derivative terms of the of the Euler Lagrange equation into account, um, and uh, I now view uh, machine learning as essentially, you know, one way of specifying is coming up with things to optimize for which the answer is something that you care about. In particular, let's say you want to restrict your space of functions f to have some property. Well, we know how to restrict that in Lagrangian mechanics. We put Lagrange multipliers. So one can think of certain types of constrained forms as corresponding to adding Lagrange multipliers. And there's a lot of things that become a lot clearer when you uh, translate things into this language. So many high energy physics tasks in theory and experiment can be phrased as some type of machine learning optimization. What you need is a well-specified loss. And there's famous ones for classification, regression, general uh, generation. Um, they have implicit or explicit regularization. Implicit regularization is relying on the particular machine learning algorithm to uh, come up with solutions that don't overfit. Explicit regularization is actually essentially adding Lagrange multiplier type terms to, um, to your loss function. You need reliable training data, either real or synthetic, fixed or dynamically sampled, um, labeled, partially labeled or unlabeled. There's various different strategies based on that some learnable function. It could be something as simple as linear regression. It could be a neural network, it could be a normalizing flow, some other parameterized form. And physics input is essential for robust uses of these tools, but interdisciplinary training is also valuable. That is, you know, going between those two slides of the statsy way of thinking about things versus the more Lagrangian mechanics way of thinking about things uh, is actually quite helpful, especially in cases where you're far away from the, the asymptotic limit. Okay, so let me pause for a second, um, and I'm just going to use two examples with this particular loss function in ways that are maybe unfamiliar to you, um, uh, that go are kind of different than what you might imagine doing with this type of likelihood ratio. Um, but let me just see if there's any questions. Of kind of naive, but 
does this Lagrangian analogy go even farther? So can you add a kinetic term for F and something interesting happens? Or I mean, does it, is it needed in any practical application? No, so, so absolutely. So uh, uh, Eva Silverstein, for example, has added kinetic terms. And what she's been working on is you add the kinetic term and then you literally solve Euler Lagrange. But then you have a kinetic term that has a nice property that as you're approaching the minimum, the velocity, the, basically you have a mass that dynamically goes up, so your velocity slows down, so you actually explore more finely in the in the space close to the minimum. And so yes, you absolutely can add uh, the derivative terms, and people are doing that as an alternate way of thinking about what the gradient descent phenomena is doing. Another way that you can use this is um, by saying I want to add penalty terms to my Lagrangian and actually have violations of, of time translation invariance and like actually imagine something where you turn on some loss term then you turn off and that would correspond to having a Lagrangian for a dissipative system that's also kind of a helpful way of, of thinking about things um, but you know when people say oh I use the binary cross entropy loss or I use the mu squared error loss and we imagine these as kind of I don't know th things that computer scientists told us to do what you can do is say, let's say my goal in life is to find this solution. You can backtrack from this. You can say, okay, this is the solution that I want to do. And if you want a homework exercise, here's your homework exercise. Come up with a family of Lagrangians that all have the same solution. And you'll find that uh, binary cross entropy is one example, mean squared error is another example. There's plenty of other ones. You can decide whether you want it to be symmetric or not, whether the P term and the Q term are the same or not. Um, all sorts of things that you can do that have the same solution. And then when you want to say, well, why do certain terms work better than other terms? You can actually analyze this derivative structure and it gives you some insights about why certain types of, of um, loss functions converge faster or slower to what you might desire. And then you can also do examples which are, are crazier to explain why, even though this is the solution, you'll never get there uh, <laughs> because it ends up being a more complicated optimization um, a problem and you know, even though asymptotically it might have this this solution in in practice the the derivatives are in some sense too small to ever get you to where you want to go okay. yeah yeah good so there are people who do hamiltonian versions of this type of thing too you can talk about positions of momenta i haven't thought myself in that language um uh yeah, partly why this this one doesn't help you right now because here there's no f dot terms. So here I'm just talking about something where it's a static problem. So it's when you want to actually imagine the learning dynamics as part of encoded in here that that is the way that you solve Euler Lagrange is going to be like baked into the equations themselves. That's when it might be helpful to switch to a Hamiltonian like picture. Here the Hamiltonian is kind of it is not helpful for this particular problem because I, I don't have a kinetic structure. I'm just imagining, oh, this is the problem that I want to solve. And then someone else tells me, here's my algorithm for solving that equation. Yeah. Um, I'm, other languages that are helpful, you, know, you can think about these as, as um, uh, partial differential equations. And people also, also think about PDEs as one way of thinking about approaching machine learning dynamics. Um, for, 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 for me, this was just helpful because I never understood apart from I, I, I it seemed mysterious why people were making claims about various loss functions and, and writing it this way helped me see what what those claims meant yeah everyone asked about let me also ask about you could make the the Lagrangian like a quantum theory out of it so what, what happens if you do this with the Lagrangian does it get into quantum computing or are you right so, so you're saying what happens if I turn this into an action so so I don't know the answer to that. Um, one thing I do know is that it's oftentimes helpful to think not as one solution, but as an ensemble of solutions. And so if I just think about just like, you know, a, a Euclidean path integral type way of doing this and um, or I want to have some kind of partition function associated with the, with the temperature, like it, sometimes it's helpful to have not just one solution in mind, but an ensemble of solutions that would be drawn from an ensemble, for example, with finite temperature, such that I would allow myself to have a non-optimal uh, loss value. I purposely uh, uh, yeah, insert some, some temperature so that I have uh, uh, as a type of regularization. Um, but I don't know if there's a particular quantum version of this that would be helpful. That's a good question. We can, I don't think so, but, but maybe, yeah.
Did I did I not answer your question sufficiently? <laughs> right. So so here I just I had to be a little bit careful. So this is not a dynamical system. This is not something that actually has time evolution in it. So I have to be careful. This version is overly simplified. This version is saying, I'm, all I'm doing is functional. This is, this is just doing calculus of variations, actually. Functional calculus of variations, uh, almost the simplest version. But, but writing it this way, for me, is just very helpful uh, conceptually, even though I think we have to be a little bit careful about taking the analogy too far. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a question? Okay, so let me give you some examples uh, of how to use this in high energy physics applications, which are probably different from uh, something that you've seen before. Okay, so let's say I'm trying to do some Monte Carlo integration beyond leading order. And I want to find an answer uh, using my favorite Monte Carlo program. And this uh, Monte Carlo program, though, has the uh, the well, the, the property that it gives me negative weight events. So for those of you who aren't familiar with how um, Monte Carlo programs work in high energy physics, you're trying to simulate some process, you're trying to approximate some scattering uh, process. And when you do an expansion in, uh, in a coupling, oftentimes the way that you do that calculation is you take a leading order result and you correct it by something proportional to that coupling, but that correction factor could be negative. Um, and there's ways of shuffling things around to make the correction term positive. But let's say I don't do that and I have these negative weight terms. As a probability density, this is perfectly fine. I have a positive piece at leading order. My next to leading order piece has some negative terms. If I histogram things, the positive and negative cancel and I'm all set. But if you hand something with negative weights to an experimentalist and ask them to pass it through their detector simulation, they would be very unhappy because negative weight events correspond to a loss of statistical precision. So let's say we have a sample with the wrong physics, but all positive weights. An experimentalist loves that because they say, oh, it's all positive weights. I don't lose much in my statistical precision. And then I have a sample with correct physics, but some of the weights are negative. Well, that's annoying. I have negative weights. Can I put these things together in some way uh, to improve my Monte Carlo sampling? Well, using this likelihood ratio trick, if I have a classifier where this is assigned one, that's assigned zero, that gives me that weight function, which is the likelihood ratio. And then what I can do is I can take the wrong physics and multiply it by that weight to get the right physics. Okay, <laughs> what does that look like in practice? So here, uh, this is a Monte Carlo program called MC at NLO. This has large weight cancellation. So the blue here shows you the weights. I have positive weights, I have negative weights. If I put them together, everything's fine, but uh, it's really annoying to have positive and negative for in terms of statistical precision. And if I use this reweighting here, I can use this reweighting such that I get exactly the same distribution after reweighting, um, going from this blue weight distribution to this green weight distribution. This green weight distribution has all positive weights, and I can get exactly the same histograms. Moreover, using a custom machine learning strategy. So this comes up with, I get to modify the loss function. So we did some stuff behind the, the scenes to make sure that not only do you get the bin heights correct, but you actually get the variances correct by um, uh, doing a, a so-called resampling procedure, where if I did naive reweighting, I would get this orange curve, which would actually underestimate the uncertainties. And this is always a danger when you're using machine learning to make sure that you actually recover the right uncertainties that you expect. So a naive reweighting actually gets you the wrong uncertainties, but you can do this resampling technique to get the correct uncertainties. And this is a way so that you get the best of both worlds. You get the correct physics, you get all positive weights. Uh, theorists are happy, experimentalists are happy, but it's driven just by this likelihood ratio trick as a way of estimating uh, this weight distribution. Yeah. No, the, 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 the correct bias, the, 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 the correct variance is the one that's given by the one with negative weights. So you can't, you, you can't use machine learning to get you know, blood from a stone, right? You, you, you can't get more than you put in. Right, so what you want to get is you want to have something that has the same statistical properties as the one with canceling weights, but you want to have it with all positive weights. So you can get the same statistical, pro same distribution, same statistical properties, fewer events, and therefore you've, you've reduced the downstream computational cost for your experimental friends. 
That that's correct. This is not about trying to uh, do better than my original sample. This is about getting the exact same properties of my original sample, just for less computational cost downstream. Now there's an interesting thing that I'll show you in a moment about, okay, well, wait a second. If you can do this after the fact, why don't you do it ahead of time? Which is a different question about how you can actually use machine learning to improve the sampling itself. And, and we'll come to an example of that uh, a little later. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to check, I understand this, right? So you take this problem and then from it, you derive some kind of Lagrangian that you then trip back into the slide you had before, solve your Lagrangian and that gives you- Yeah. The, does that give you a loss function? That, that, that loss function answer gives me this function. Okay, so so you're... so so so, so th this is a, it's a funny type of thing. Instead of saying I want to solve directly a machine learning problem, I did not say for this one I want to get rid of negative weights. What I said was what I really want is a, a function that I can apply to the wrong sample, reweight it to get the right physics. It happens to be that there is a machine learning architecture or machine learning loss framework that gives you that function as the answer that then I apply here. But in some sense, all I'm doing is just using the likelihood ratio trick in a, in a funny way. Um, and you know, a number of the research papers that I've written actually just do something along those lines that you say, machine learning is really good at doing this widget. Can I use that widget in some other context where it could be useful? Um, of course, what you really would like to do is is bake machine learning in directly into the into the generation, so that you save computational costs not just on the back end, but also in the in the on the on the fore side. But that's that's what I'm doing here. I answer your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So is that the this what? Sorry, I I missed what the the first. Yes. In, is in, in what space? I'm sorry. In oh, entire space phase space. space. Ah, good. 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 So this trick, this trick asymptotically works everywhere in phase space. But now you say, well, come on, what if I what if my sampling of P and Q is so sparse that I don't actually have events populating the region of phase space that I want? What you would like is you would like the machine learning architecture to spit out for you something that says, hey, by the way, you haven't given me enough events in that region of phase space. What I showed you right here did not does not do that. What I showed you here is something that you can verify after the fact that it works, but you still have this lingering concern like, oh, I'm really concerned that the machine learning actually hasn't, for example, found the right solution um, or maybe you know hasn't finished training. And you would like to actually have the machine report not only an answer, but saying, here's how confident I am in the answer. And there are various ways of trying to do that in a statistically rigorous way. That's not shown here. But this is the, a, a, a totally valid concern of saying, if I don't have information, you would like the machine to report, hey, I don't have information. And a lot of the methods that we currently have don't do that. They do blind kind of extrapolation or interpolation. And we don't always know what it's doing. And one of the things that I've would like to be thinking about this week is how can you make sure that as you move away from the asymptotic limit and you're in regions of phase space where you don't have enough information, the machine says, I don't have information that I want to report to you. Look, I don't have that information in hand. There are ways with this technique that you can kind of get that information, but there's always the concern that it hasn't right, quite found its way there. And there's ways of doing validation after the fact, but those don't make me confident. And in particular, here's what I would like. I would like someone to give me a machine learning uh, framework where if my optimization totally fails, it reports that it totally fails. You know, <laughs> and, and the current things that I've been using don't do that. It says, oh, you know, here's my best guess, but that best guess could be totally off and I'd like to know when it's off. Um, ideally, also know by how much, but at least be, be warned that it's not working the way that you want it to. And that's especially true in, in rare regions of phase space. Again, we can validate here, but you know, there's not as many events here. Am I really sure that it's right? So I, I didn't know this, this paper of yours. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to do this, but for a slightly different reason, because in fact, like Poweg or several Monte Carlos, they are designed to have very small fraction of negative weights. Yes. 
So to some extent, this thing of the negative weights uh, is not volume is not super yeah. important. But sometimes can be conceptually super important to be able to generate toys, which you cannot do if you have negative weights. You cannot unweight a negative yeah. sample. Yeah. So we, we were actually willing to do that, but if you've done it already, for, 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 for being able to generate toys by reweighting the, the, the leading order sample yeah. and doing this. And uh, yeah, so... so Right. There's other applications of this, by the way. Another application you might have is you might uh, want to have one meta sample where you have, with your correct physics, you have some adjustable parameter and you want to be able to do one, have one event sample, but you want to be able to, for example, adjust the coupling constant sure, sure, and you want to yeah, just take, yeah. take that with, with, with weight variation. And that's also a way, reason why you might want to use something like this. Yeah, 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 for negative yeah. positive weight parameter. It, it, by the way, the, the trick here, the, 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 the magic is not this function, which is what's shown here. The, the magic is this resampling to make sure you don't fool yourself into thinking that you have more. Yeah, exactly. so, right. So, so, so th th this part is a little bit non-trivial, and essentially what you do here is that you learn not, you learn the variances. You don't just learn the value; you learn the variances. And and, and this this going back to what you were saying before, this doesn't give you an handle over the failure of the method. Like <laughs> I wish it did. I wish it gave it. That that was the goal of doing this. But but it, but this is itself yet another machine learning. Can fail to give right? you that so, so this one could also be wrong, and and so that's why I'm not fully satisfied. I, I can give you other examples of like toy examples where I say, this is what the machine does, and clearly it's not. For example, I give you a a randomly initialized Bayesian neural network, but I haven't trained it at all, and then I say, okay. Does that random? It's, it has Bayesian in the name, so it's supposed to capture uncertainties, but there's no training. So if it's a totally untrained Bayesian neural network, ideally that Bayesian neural network should hand you, you know, confidence intervals that are gigantic. But that's not the way that they're random that you get when you randomly initialize. So that's an example of something where it seems pretty obvious that there should be a workaround for that, where a randomly initialized network, even one that claims to give you uncertainties, you should be able to make sure that it initializes at least with large uncertainties. So let me give you another example that uh, that uses this likelihood ratio trick. Um, so this is uh, in the context of experimental uh, uh, detector unfolding, where you have uh, some notion of what the underlying truth is, like the real particles that unfortunately hit your detector, and then you have to reconstruct what's going on. And you would like to know, given data that you measure, what's the best um, uh, estimate for what the underlying uh, distribution is. So this is the inverse problem, unfolding problem, deconvolution. These are all names for the same thing. And let's say you have a synthetic data set where you've generated truth events and you've seen what happens after your detector simulation to get you to detector level. And Basically, you can use repeated applications of this likelihood ratio trick and this reweighting to uh, iteratively reweight things at detector level so data and simulation look the same, and then pump it through uh, to generation and do some kind of self reweighting in order to get something that's consistent. So, this is an iterative strategy to do essentially just a maximum likelihood um, uh, analysis. It's uh, analogous to uh, iterative Bayesian unfolding, if people know that terminology. But again, it's a funny use of, of machine learning where you're using machine learning to compute reweighting factors as reweighting factors are, are used in the context of, of um, solving the inverse problem. And just as an example uh, of a long overdue paper <laughs> uh, where we're going back to E plus E minus data and this archival data, uh, was originally stored as an archive where it was binned information. And the reason why these bins in green are wide here and narrower as you go to up is because it was binned in a linear scale. It turns out for some certain theoretical calculations, you'd like to do the binning in a logarithmic scale, but that was not done uh, back when the Aleph data was originally analyzed. And so we've got the raw data or semi-raw data and applied this iterative uh, uh, unfolding strategy and you get this red histogram, which is actually intrinsically unbinned. That is, I get essentially weight values for Monte Carlo. Those weight values are, I can use to fill any histogram. In this particular case, I'm filling this histogram here where you can see, you know, <laughs> if you report results this way, you can actually do something that as a theorist, I'd like to do the theoretical calculation for. Okay, so, you know, the, 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 the question that then sometimes comes up when you show these examples is, okay, but what is the machine learning? You know, what feature is the machine learning to do these amazing tasks? And, and I, I purposely chose these two tasks 
of correcting negative weights and doing detector unfolding, because this is not something that you'd think of as a, being associated with human intelligence, right? Uh, these are not tasks that humans do better than computers before. And these are just tasks that we'd like to do, where we have algorithms to do them. We have traditional algorithms to do uh, uh, those, those cases. And so asking the question about what is the machine learning is, you know, okay, <laughs> anthropomorphizing things. Like, I don't like this language because what the machine is doing is it's finding an approximate solution to a well-defined optimization problem. Um, and we got to choose what the optimization problem was, and we have to decide whether we trust the particular optimization algorithm. And so I'd like to think of just a space of analysis strategies of different ways that we might approach doing our analysis. Um, we have machine learning, which I'll just say algorithms based on learning solutions through the use of data. Sometimes that's synthetic data, sometimes it's experimental data. Deep learning, which are algorithms based on learning parameters of multi-layered neural network. And in most cases, the machine is learning, what is it doing? It's just finding an approximate solution to a well-specified optimization problem. And again, we get to choose the optimization problem. So when people talk about AI, I think we have in our minds, you know, algorithms to perform tasks that are typically associated with intelligent beings. And some people say that ML is a subset of AI. I'll show you why I think there's actually examples that exist in the ML world and not in the AI world uh, in, in a moment. And then what I'm calling here physics intelligence, algorithms to perform tasks that are typically associated with physics majors or physics PhDs. And the fact that these blobs are not overlapping implies that physics majors and PhDs are maybe not intelligent beings, but um, but why, why am I making this distinction? I'm making this distinction because oops, there are tasks like linear regression. You know, linear regression is a machine learning technique. It's, it's based on um, uh, learning a solution through the use of data, but is it really a type of AI? That is, is there anything kind of intelligent with it? Um, and usually intelligence is associated with coming up with some higher level concepts. Um, and in the case of linear regression, the features are already given to you. You're not synthesizing them in any, any particularly fancy way. Um, do I really want to regard that as a type of AI? Similarly, phase space integration or Monte Carlo reweighting, is that really a type of AI? It's certainly something that intelligent physicists do, and they may even do it using deep learning, but is it really learning something that has the kind of higher level structures that we associate with intelligent beings? I'm not so sure. I think it'd be helpful for us to push the boundaries of all these circles in, in, in various ways, but in some sense, we should use the analysis strategy that's best suited for the task at hand. In certain cases, we really do want something that has interpretable structure to it. In other cases, we just want an answer that we have uncertainties attached to it. And it's not actually so clear to me that you want to have interpretable meaning to it. Rather, I'd like to have uncertainties, but those uncertainties, I don't need to ascribe intelligence to them. I just need to be able to trust them in a statistical way. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things going on uh, uh, in, in our field that you know, aren't are, are you know, like some kind of combination of physics intelligence and machine learning. Not in all cases do we actually have an interpretable, in the human sense of that word, uh, understanding of what the output is. Yeah. Okay, so that was um, uh, kind of things that changed my mind. And part of changing my mind was splitting this yellow circle from this green circle as well, of saying, look, there are things that I do with data that aren't necessarily intelligent and do not need to have an interpretable, interpretable answer. Uh, in particular, you know, I don't care, <laughs> this W, I don't care that this thing has a, a well understood functional form. I care that I know the uncertainties attached to it. And it may or may not have a nice expression in terms of some interpretable functions. In fact, it probably isn't. You have wrong physics, correct physics. Why should that ratio have anything that's human interpretable in it? It's just a solution to an optimization problem. Okay. Okay, so now I want to go through th this, this, uh, this thing that I said before. Um, about these kind of three lessons that I've learned. Um, and I guess we're going, just so I have time, we, we go to 12.30, All right? So please keep asking questions. Okay, okay. Okay, so as I said, these slides were taken, oh yeah, question. The question of how to learn is rather 
Good, good. So, so for, I 100% agree that it needs to be interpretable, but I guess I would, part, partly why I'm putting this physics intelligence thing here is that the applications that people think about when they think about artificial intelligence are ones like pattern recognition, image recognition, where as a human, we have a, our internal notion about whether something's doing a good job or a bad job. You know, so you know, people are endlessly fascinated with the ability to take words, type it into Dali, and you get these pictures. And that's a type of, of human intelligence. It's something that I could give those words to a human and say, please draw me a picture of it, and they could. If you give, gave a human the task of figuring out a rigorous statistical test uh, to know whether a theory was correct or not, they wouldn't be able to do it. Or rather what they do is they write a computer program to do it. So like there, there are techniques that we do that are not necessarily the kind of human intelligent variety, but absolutely they need to be interpreted. But the standard for interpretation in this case is a statistical interpretation. And maybe that's the point that I that I just want to emphasize. And, and partly, again, this is a slide deck aimed at machine learning skeptics. And they say, I don't believe that AI has any relevance for physics, to which I could say, yeah, you're probably correct that actually living in this green purple circle land probably is actually where we want to be. We don't want to have me being able to type in, please generate for me a Higgs boson event <laughs> and like just pump that into Dolly and it generates an event display. That's not useful. <laughs> Unless you piped in, you know, uh, please give me uh, uh, next to next to next leading order distribution of events. That's not right. But right. So, but, but so it, it's much more emphasizing that there is a value in learning things on data that have a rigorous meaning, even if they don't have a human interpretable in the sense of of like person on the street. It might have a physicist interpretable meaning, though. Is that is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So, um, sorry, just yeah. a genetic. Cool. Maybe one thing one can also add is like the analogy with, with NNPDF, no? Yes. Let's say uh, phenomenological parameterization of the PDF with some polynomials and functions yes. are as non informative as a neural network in terms of physics. Yes. Because we don't have. So, yeah. yeah. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll show a slide about PDFs in a second. That's a perfect example. Uh, an NNPDF, like there, what are you looking for? You're looking for a flexible parameterization. And in fact, the questions that we should be asking about NNPDF is not, what is the machine learning? It's what is the implicit or explicit regularization that's being used? And is that appropriate for determining PDFs? Absolutely, but still it's going uh, much above, right? And at, at the higher level of consciousness, yeah. if you want, oh. than the previous PDF feed. Yeah, it's a higher level of consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. it, but that's right. But it's, it's, it's achieving a higher level of consciousness. <laughs> It's a funny way of saying it. it it's, it's, it's finding better solutions because it's more flexible, right? But it, um, let, let me just make an, another side remark um, that uh, sometimes you hear people saying, well, machine learning is too flexible. You have too many parameters. In fact, you have more parameters than you have data points in certain cases. So you know, shouldn't I be worried about overfitting? But in physics, physics land, we know about examples like this where as the number of degrees of freedom increases, the your explainability also well, i'm not sure wait, wait, the, the, the actually effective numbers of degrees of freedom go down namely thermodynamics thermodynamics is you have more and more and more things governed by statistical properties you can actually describe it by fewer and fewer high level uh, uh parameters so it's actually maybe not surprising that you can have a million billion parameter uh neural network that nevertheless is good generalization uh in the same way that thermodynamics works and you could yeah i'm gonna leave it there Okay. okay, so the, the again, these were taken from the snowmass thing. So TFO5 was the theory frontier in lattice field theory. And here this is showing how deep learning is influencing the lattice field theory world. Um, so this is from my colleague, Fiala Shanahan. And, um, uh, and I think it's a, a, just a, a nice example of, of one thing that deep learning is doing for fundamental physics applications. So you know, this is a situation where the equations governing the strong nuclear force, namely QCD, are, are known, at least the lattice version of it in Euclidean space. 
But precision computations are extremely demanding. And apparently it's like 10% of open su supercomputing resources in the United States are being dedicated to, uh, to lattice gauge theory calculations. And they're relevant for also sorts of, of things. Um, you know, for example, it's now possible to simulate proton-proton fusion. You can simulate that uh, on the lattice uh, and extract uh, answers for the proton proton fusion rate that are competitive with uh, experimental extractions. And so what Fiala uh, and her collaborators did, they, they had an industry collaboration working with folks at DeepMind, and they have a custom generative model based on normalizing flows that achieves a thousand fold acceleration while preserving the symmetries and with a guarantee of exactness. So what's, how do you get a guarantee of exactness? The way you get a guarantee of exactness is that you use machine learning as a sampling algorithm, but you nevertheless do the same important sampling strategy with accept reject steps to guarantee that asymptotically you get the right answer. So you're using machine learning in a way where even if the machine has a bad guess for what the generative model for lattice gauge theory configurations are, even if the guess is bad, because it has coverage over the full phase space, you can either reweight or accept reject in order to get the correct answer. So this is a case where you have guarantees of exactness. And then in terms of preserving symmetries, this preserves the gauge symmetry that you need to have on the lattice. And what's kind of interesting is that the gauge symmetry that you need for SU3 is a compact symmetry. Um, and it turns out that compact symmetries in, uh, exist in other domains, like in robotics, where you have a pivot or, or, or joints that have uh, 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 U1 symmetries. And so these tools that were designed for physics find interdisciplinary applications because you know it's not just uh, gauge theorists who like to make sure that they have appropriate symmetries. And just showing kind of this, this interfacing between, on the one hand, you have the deep learning and that's using normalizing flows as a generative model for lattice gauge theory configurations. Interfacing with you know, the theoretical physicists, you know, deep thinking, uh, maintaining gauge equivariance, and then something that's somewhere between those two areas, uh, doing machine learning on compact domains. And what you see in this toy example is, again, this thousand fold increase in your ability to generate gauge field configurations that have, uh, uh, let's say, high weight uh, to, to mean that you're with less computational cost, you're getting the same uh, uh, level of uh, precision on your calculation. And the thing that I didn't add is that, um, I guess it was three weeks ago at the Lattice 2022 uh, conference, they've this same collaboration showed the first application of this technique to a theory that had fermions uh, that also lived in three plus one dimensions. And they're you know, making real progress in uh, overturning the standard lattice gauge theory sampling paradigm and using this more machine learning based one. But again, it's machine learning where you're guaranteed that the answer uh, is, is correct in the sense that it's just important sampling with a uh, cleverly machine learned uh, uh, approximation which again, you can correct by, um, because you know what the underlying uh, probability densities are supposed to be. Okay, so this is an example of, of machine learning affecting uh, lattice gauge theory. Uh, TFO7 is the working group uh, that I was responsible for. So uh, uh, the work in, in collider phenomenology. And so here are just eight plots taken from eight papers showing examples of where deep learning is being used in, in collider phenomenology. So uh, a very classic case is jet classification, where you have uh, some spray of particles that you want to know, does that spray of particles, did it originate from a fragmentation of a quark? Did it originate from fragmentation of a gluon? In this particular case, this is a, a study looking for whether it came from fragmentation of a, of a Lorentz boosted top quark. And various of these strategies have shown uh, uh, fantastic results on doing that classification task. Now, some of these strategies are deeper than others. And one of this spaghetti lines <laughs> is linear regression. And I will tell you, it is not the bottom one. So linear regression actually does a perfectly fine job on this classification task if the inputs to the linear regression are features that a theorist came up with. Um, and so we had to be a little bit careful about whether the deepness is important. In this case, a relatively shallow learning task did quite well for this problem. This is the example of part-time distribution functions from NNPDF, where this is just parameterizing uh, uh, part-time distribution functions using a neural network um, and using gradient-based strategies to optimize uh, that function. A parameter influence, a parameter inference is something that that uh, that we do all the time in high energy physics and coming up with confidence intervals. Um, and what's kind of interesting about some of these machine learning-based approaches to parameter inference is that it's possible to use 
auxiliary information to get better confidence intervals with the same uh, uh, data. Basically, if you know something about how your data was generated, you can use information about that generative model to come up with confidence bounds uh, that are better than traditional uh, methods. Again, in, uh, 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 in enabled by deep learning techniques. People have worked on parton shower modeling and tuning. You can generate synthetic uh, parton showers uh, using deep learning approaches and actually see whether uh, what the deep learning is doing, how that compares to traditional parton shower methods. You can do phase space integration, where again, this is similar to this lattice gauge theory case where you're just trying to sample regions of phase space and you can do it with, uh, with, with neural networks. You can do it with normalizing flows. The amplitudes that go into high energy physics calculations can themselves be very expensive to compute, so you can approximate them using uh, neural networks. In this case, neural networks are basically just being used as lookup tables for more complicated functions. And then experimental things like mitigating overlapping proton proton collisions or this uh, unfolding technique that I've mentioned before. These are things that um, that also have been done with, with, with deep learning. And the progress here is made not just because of increased computational power in large data sets. I think that's one of the things that we we emphasize about why machine learning does such a great job on, on variety of tasks, but also because we've understood the structure of the underlying problems and we've understood the extent to which these high energy physics tasks are, are optimization tasks. And um, just to emphasize this, here are, are six examples of network architectures where a theoretical prior, some kind of guess about the underlying structure of the problem, matches onto the way that you would design your neural network. So for example, if you're dealing with data that you think should be treated as a pixelized calorimeter, you think that what you have is particles going into calorimeters and the way it should be analyzed is with calorimeter cells, then, well, you'd wanna have something like a convolutional neural network that works on fixed grid geometries. If you think that the way that your data was generated was some kind of hierarchical parton shower, well, then you want to use some kind of hierarchical graph neural network type approach to analyze your data. If you think that it's pairwise interactions between particles, that that's actually the governing physics, then you want to do, for example, message passing uh, graph type architectures. If you think that Lorentz invariance or Lorentz equivariance is something that's really important, okay, then fine. Do the equivalent of the Klebsch-Gordon decomposition, but for SO3 comma one, and make sure that every layer of your network respects those Klebsch-Gordon uh, uh, relations. If you think that you wanna use something called the Lund plane, which shows up in QCD, um, you can do things as described in terms of Lund plane additions. Or if you're me and you care a lot about infrared and collinear safety, which is a requirement for observables to be calculable order by order and perturbation theory, then you can come up with a neural network architecture that actually enforces infrared and collinear safety. And this tangle of, of rubber bands here is a neural network's learned representation of the collinear singularity structure of QCD. So what we're doing here is we're sending a spray of particles centered on this center point and then asking the machine to, in an infrared and collinear safe way, focus its attention on the regions of that spray of particles that it thinks are most relevant to solving the problem at hand. And you can see that this tangle of, of, uh, of rubber bands is azimuthally symmetric. That's because when you're dealing with unpolarized information, there's a symmetry around the axis in which those, that radiation is going. So it's learning to pay attention to things in an azimuthally symmetric way. And it's learning that you want to have large rubber bands on the outside and smaller rubber bands going into the middle. And actually, the scaling of those uh, follows the one over theta collinear singularity structure that, that, that QCD has. So it's actually paying attention to the fact that information is roughly logarithmically distributed in distance from the, the central axis. So this is a case where you enforce a symmetry, infrared and collinear safety, and then it actually learns an interesting symmetry structure. And you can imagine rinsing and repeating and putting that azimuthal symmetry and that logarithmic scaling into your neural network and seeing what next structure that it learns. Okay. The colors are just ways of disambiguating it. This has 100, sorry, this one have 128. Either 128 or 256 rubber bands. Each rubber band is enclosing a region of interest. And then the colors are just so it doesn't become a big muck. Of course, it is big muck, and I should have taken this one and made it full screen for the purpose of this talk. But. Okay, so okay, so I, I'm convinced that high energy physics has been irreversibly impacted, but it's not just AI and 
I think you know we should be leveraging analysis strategies from various areas of mathematics, statistics, and computer science. And one area that I learned about um, is uh, an area known as optimal transport theory. And optimal transport, uh, I mean, one way of describing it is if you're trying to ship packages from your warehouses to consumers' homes and you want to do it in the most efficient way, you would like to find the trajectories that minimize the amount of uh, you know, time that the delivery vehicles have to be on the road. That type of optimal transport problem doesn't sound like it has anything to do with collider physics, but actually optimal transport can be used to define a collider geometry. So here is an example of two jets, two sprays of radiation that are going into the page, which each dot corresponds to how much energy is deposited in that region. We have two jets, the red jet and the blue jet, and I want to distort the red jet to look like the blue jet, and that's solving an optimal transport problem. You can think about the red jet as being the distribution centers, the blue jet as being consumers' homes. You want to transport your TVs from the red to the blue, and these black lines show the optimal transportation plan. And again, this doesn't sound like it has anything to do necessarily with, with collider physics, but you can use these distances from the red jet to the blue jet to define a distance in an abstract space, the distance between the red configuration and the blue configuration, and actually use this to triangulate a geometry. And once you're given pairwise distances, you can triangulate a geometry, um, and that geometry uh, has fascinating uh, uh, fractal patterns, which I'm happy to talk to you more about. But this is a situation where I gain new insights into high energy physics facilitated by advances in this more mathematics or uh, computational geometry sphere. And with this geometry, what are certain things, what are some things that you can do? So it turns out that with this perspective of optimal transport, you can actually translate six decades of things that we do in collider physics, you can translate them into a geometric language. And this geometric language makes certain things on this timeline a lot easier to understand. So for example, going back to the 1960s, this concept of inferred and collinear safety, what inferred and collinear safety corresponds to is epsilon delta type style proofs of smoothness on this geometry. So when you have observables that are sufficiently smooth or continuous on the emergent geometry defined by optimal transport, that's what it means to be infrared and collinear safe. And in fact, it wasn't even fully understood what the definition of infrared and collinear safety was um, until our work, because there are different notions of continuity that you can have in spaces and different people were arguing about what's the, what's the correct definition of continuity. In fact, all those definitions of continuity could potentially be the right one to use and different levers of, of continuity correspond to different degrees of calculability in perturbation theory. But in any case, this geometric picture tells you how to think about this concept of infrared and collinear safety. In the 1970s, people developed a variety of event shapes to classify not classify, in order to characterize radiation patterns, uh, including uh, my colleague at MIT, Eddie Farhi, developed an observable called thrust, and then down the street, uh, Howard Georgi, who developed an observable called sporosity. And it turns out that these event shapes can be thought of as the distance of closest approach between an event and a manifold in this abstract space. And that distance corresponds to the event shape. So how close you are to a given manifold of configurations, uh, that's what this event shape characterizes. Jet algorithms, you take a spray of radiation and you want to uh, summarize that in terms of some number of identified uh, jet objects. That corresponds to projections to manifolds defined by uh, n elements. The field of jet substructure that I'm part of uh, corresponds to also these projections to manifolds. And in particular, work that I did on an observable called uh, n subjettiness turns out to be easier to explain in this optimal transport language than it is in the original language that I, I had in our paper. And then pilot mitigation, which is a very experimental uh, effect where you have an event that's been contaminated by a uniform spray of radiation. What you can do is you can describe that as moving on a geodesic away from the uniform point. So there's a uniform point of uniform radiation in this abstract space. You're in the contaminated world and you can move away from it along a geodesic a certain amount. And that corresponds to a pilot mitigation algorithms. So again, these are examples of things that are machine learning in the sense that they use data, but actually just a different element of the uh, computational uh, uh, sciences field that turns out to be very relevant for understanding high energy physics, or at least translating high energy physics into a new language. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, energy correlators in there's two types of energy correlators. The, 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 the original ones like the Ellis style ones, the uh, that that uh, Ian Moult has been st studying a lot recently where you're taking an ensemble average where, where you basically fix the. The, the, these recent papers. Yes. Those ones correspond to functions that are defined on energy flows. Yes. But they are not, but well, because they're infrared and collinear safe. I don't know of a nice language in terms of this computational geometry to describe what they're doing. They're defined on energy flows. So they're defined on the same inputs that are relevant for this optimal transport problem. Oops. Ideally, those would be learned. Right now, they're not. Right now, they're fixed. They should be learned. I can and I can tell you why that you don't want to learn them. Actually, let me just tell you right now. So, um, let's say your goal in life is to do a classification. If your goal in life is to do a classification, then the best thing that you can do, the best classifier, is the likelihood ratio between the signal and background. By the name and Pearson lemma, that that defines the the optimal uh, 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 classifier choice. If you learn the energy correlators, the energy correlators are not describable in that same language of a likelihood ratio. A likelihood ratio is one number assigned to an event. Energy correlators give you a variety of numbers assigned to an event. And so therefore the energy correlators, if you machine learn with them, are always going to be less performance than something that learns a single object per event. So you always do better by doing standard observables and not these energy ensemble averaged observables for classification tasks. Now for regression tasks, you can make a similar argument, but you can, but I'm actually working with a student on trying to find ways of getting around this naive uh, 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 intuition that you you always do better to learn traditional observables and not to learn these ensemble average based ones. But you're implying, for example, that the top mark measurement based on energy correlated would always be less performance than uh, a top mark measurement based on events from properties Okay, so we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful. Yeah, so, no, no, so we have to be very careful. The optimal observable to extract the top part mass, if you had perfect knowledge of the theory, would be a traditional observable and not one of these energy correlators. However, we don't have a perfect knowledge of the theory. So the question then is, if I don't have perfect knowledge, are the systematics smaller on the on these energy correlators such that I'm better off doing that style of approach versus doing a machine learning optimal classifier type approach or optimal regression type approach? Sorry, big meaning it's it's sensitive in a good way. Ah, good. So, right. So we have to be so good. And, and what I'm saying is that if that's competitive, then you'll get something even more competitive if you use a machine learning style approach. However, it may be that your ability to predict those distributions are such that the systematics make make it still better to do the energy correlator approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just skip over. Actually, let me let me let me do this. So, so one of the things that's been kind of interesting with um, with this optimal transport is that there's various different versions of optimal transport. There's linear tr transport, partial transport, kernel methods, and uh, these are uh, slides taken from the group at um, at uh, UC Santa Barbara that's doing a lot of 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 work into um, uh, using optimal transport for high energy physics applications, and What's really interesting when you start to dive into this literature is you start to learn that some of the ideas that are being used here are ones that either physicists came up with first or should have come up with first. So there are methods that are known as optimal transport methods. There's different methods that are known as kernel methods. Um, and I color coded kernel methods in purple in terms of high energy physics domain knowledge. Why did I do that? It's because I found this PhD thesis that describes kernel methods. Um, and describes what kernel methods are. And the number one analogy that this person used to describe what kernel methods are was Newtonian gravitation and electrostatics and physics. 
So just quoting from here, what are these kernel methods? Okay, they're ubiquitous in data science applications. Unfortunately, though, few papers and textbooks take the time to draw explicit links between fields that have at first glance very little in common. And so it turns out that kernel methods can be viewed as just finding uh, configurations that minimize uh, the potential energy in electrostatics. And so if I go back to this thing here, what we have is we have a blue blob and a red blob. We have a blue blob and a red blob that are being optimally transported between each other. So in this bottom row, which looks the best, the blue blob, uh, these are the red blob, actually, well, it's hard to tell the colors. It's like red, green, there's two things. One is the vector is green, the actual distribution is red. This one flows nice and smoothly to this distribution. So this is an optimal transport based way. This top one is a kernel methods based way. And when you first see this, you say, well, this thing is not working so well. Um, it has all these scattered things that are not moving. And you say, well, why is this the case? And people were very confused who worked on these kernel methods about why this was the case. Um, but it's very easy to explain if you have the idea of electrostatics uh, in mind. So what's going on here is that in this line here, you can think about the blue as being positive charge that's anchored to locations. You can think about the red green things as being negative charge that then allowed to move. And once enough of this red green thing has overlapped there, you get electrostatic screening. And that, that electrostatic screening actually makes it so that these other dots move way, way slower to where they wanna go. And so these optimal transport based methods are better because they don't have that screening uh, effect. These are however, more computationally uh, expensive in certain cases. And so being able to interpolate between this electrostatic screening like behavior and this optimal transport behavior is sometimes useful. And again, the physicists could have come up with this first because again, we understand how electrostatics works in our field. Okay, so let me uh, skip this and then come to the, the last thing that I wanna say. And so this, this last part is just inspiration for us to think about um, translating aspects of our field into a more computational language. So one question is whether machine learning could ever be relevant for formal theory questions. And what aspects of formal theory could be rephrased as a data science problem, albeit data with, albeit a data science problem where you have theoretical data. So as part of our AI Institute, uh, my colleague, Jim Halverson, who's at Northeastern, he's been using uh, uh, machine learning strategies to solve various mathematical problems, including ones involving knots. Here, uh, this is uh, developing a correspondence between neural networks and quantum field theories, where insights from one side uh, influences the other. So quantum field theories, you can think about that as a theory of random functions. We don't usually think about quantum field theories as describing a theory of random functions. At least if I have Euclidean quantum field theory, you can think about having a partition function defined by the action. And a quantum field theory is defined by the distribution of functions that you would get from this particular uh, path integral construction. And that's one way of defining what a quantum field theory is, just a theory of random functions where the action tells you the probability of which you're going to uh, sample a given function. Neural networks can also be thought of as a theory of random functions, um, but that theory of random functions is defined instead by their construction of how many nodes I have, how many hidden layers, what's the distribution of weights uh, at initialization. And you can find a mapping between things that we do in the quantum field theory side and things that we do on the neural network side, such that there's ways of describing neural network dynamics in a QFT language, and there's ways of defining QFTs as a type of, of neural network. And this might be an example of a, a fruitful dialogue between people thinking about more formal theoretical developments um, and the machine learning community. What about machine learning for physics beyond the standard model? Um, this is an example taken from a study of anomaly detection in this data set, the LHC Olympics 2020 uh, challenge, where uh, synthetic data that had hidden in it some evidence for new physics was uh, deployed and various groups, including my group, tried to predict what the masses of uh, potential resonances inside this, this data set were. The correct answer is around four TeV. You can see a variety of strategies getting there, sometimes with or without trustable error bars. And then my group is the human neural network, which did not get the right answer, which I'll explain in a second why that's the case. But we can ask, you know, what aspects of beyond the standard model phenomenology could be streamlined, systematized, and automated? You know, as we enter into the high luminosity LHC era, 
we have an opportunity to explore a huge range of BSM scenarios, but do we really want to have an entire PhD thesis dedicated to each and every one of those scenarios, or is there a way of more systematically exploring uh, the phase space of new physics models, especially ones that might not have been uh, 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 thought up uh, in terms of a Lagrangian description uh, uh, at the time that the data was analyzed. Um, and this example here of our human neural network getting it so wrong is an example of why we need to be wary about uh, uh, simply applying uh, techniques to, uh, to data without thinking more about systematic issues. So here, what we did is we started plotting a variety of observables that had been useful in the past for unearthing new physics scenarios. And we saw a bump, a giant one, a giant one at around one TeV. Again, the real bump is at 400 uh, T, sorry, 4 TeV. We saw this one at one TeV. What were we seeing? And it is hugely statistically significant, hugely statistically significant. And no other group saw it except for our group. And again, we didn't really use a neural network. We used you know, this neural network <laughs> to do it. So, so what happened here? So what happened was that the analysis was based on a dijet resonance scenario. You had some heavy object decaying to two dijets with some interesting structure. We thought that the people who did this challenge might have been tricky and might have actually generated three jet topologies. And so what did we do? We, we plotted a variety of three jet configurations, or sorry, observable sensitive to three jet configurations, and we found features up the wazoo, things that didn't agree with our best Monte Carlo estimate. So how is that possible? Well, the way that's possible is that one of the people who ran the LHC Olympics generated a background sample for this uh, this uh, data challenge, which differed from the background sample used for um, uh, for uh, R and D purposes, and that sample, uh, the, the this background sample, had a flag turned on it in the Pythia Monte Carlo generator that made Pythia generate unphysical configurations, unphysical configurations that overpopulated three jet regions of phase space. And so this is a situation where actually we've discovered a feature. It happened to be a background mismodeling feature. It was real, <laughs> happened not to be the one that, that was, was the challenge was, was designed for. But it emphasizes for me, one, the opportunity that we have in deploying a variety of anomaly detection strategies to look for new physics at the LHC, but also the importance of making sure you have some type of validation to make sure that what you're seeing is real and not just some background uh, artifact. And in this case, instead of us being wrong, I would like to say that we actually won the LHC Olympics <laughs> because we found the most statistically significant anomaly there just happened to be an anomaly in the in the background. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, the, the, this game cannot be finding the particle that someone decided to put, but finding a discrepancy with respect to what you expect. Yes. And so that's precisely. Yes. Then in that sense, we won. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, but this also tells you something else. But, but... Right. It, 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 the... Yeah, well, okay. There's, there's other things that we could say about this. Yeah. So what about machine learning for, for standard model physics? Um, and, and something that I've been very interested in has been the fact that theory calculations, standard model theory calculations, take really long time to do. Maybe machine learning will accelerate this, but the time between a next to leading order calculation to a next to next to leading order calculation to a next to next to next to leading order calculation. Sometimes those time scales can be measured in decades. And you'd like to be able to go back in time and actually apply the latest and greatest theory tools to archival data sets. Or in the case of these, you mentioned these energy energy correlators, we now have a theory for energy energy correlators that's much better than the theory that we had when they were first proposed in the 1970s. We should be able to do that. But the way that our current infrastructure is, is set up is such that if the theory calculation doesn't exist at the time that the data was collected, then we don't have a way of uh, comparing that theory calculation to the experimental data, unless that particular observable that was under study was, was the precise one archived. And it may be that other observables of interest uh, that we have better theory predictions for um, might uh, come down the line. And so um, I've been championing the, the uh, archiving of data and potential open data uh, as something that we could do and potentially using machine learning to try to help with uncertainty quantification and public data sets. 
Um, and these are plots taken from a group of experimentalists who tried to analyze in some sense, their own data, a group of folks, some of them were from the CMS experiment, trying to reproduce analyses from the CMS experiment, finding interesting discrepancies. So for example, in this case, uh, uh, trying to measure some fiducial WZ cross-section where the official answer from CMS is uh, you know, within the expectation of the standard model, but their own extraction is off by some amount. And you'd like to understand why that's the case. Is there a way of using machine learning as a way to both for data uh, archiving and, and quantifying potential uncertainties there and more tightly integrating theory and experiment to future, future proof analyses such that uh, you know, after the experiment's done, we could nevertheless still go back to those data sets and, um, and uh, compare them to theoretical calculations and, and machine learning may be a, a strategy for doing that. And then my, my last example is an example from my own group, um, which, if I weren't giving this overview summary talk, I'd be trying to explain to you what this plot is. And so happy to tell you more about the story if you're interested. But this is a plot that if you looked at it, you would say that just looks like a plot that doesn't learn look like anything that's machine learning related. Um, but actually this uses machine learning in a lot of essential ways, even though it's hidden behind the scenes. So let me just try to go through all these various uh, things at the top. So it uses public data from the CMS experiment. That's what I was advocating for on the previous slide. It uses this omnifold detector unfolding strategy um, to try to correct for detector effects. This is a particular analysis where detector effects uh, would actually mask uh, the physics that you'd like to study unless you correct it for them. Uh, this cute koala reading a book. <laughs> this is using a technique called koala, classification without labels, reading a book because it's using a technique from natural language processing called topic modeling. So that's the koala reading a book. <laughs> And this topic modeling is used to separate uh, a, a sample of quark jets from gluon jets using uh, a semi-supervised uh, machine learning technique called Koala. You saw this before, this is using this infrared and collinear safe uh, a machine learning algorithm in order to accomplish this task. Uh, this here is a, a logo coming from, uh, again, this uh, topic modeling procedure. Optimal transport turns out to be in here, and this is all happening as part of this NSF AI Institute that I'm, that I'm uh, directing. And what this plot is here is, for, as a QCD person, really fascinating. So what this is showing is showing you the dimensionality of the space of quark jets and gluon jets. So as I told you before, optimal transport can be used to make a collider geometry. And if you have a geometry, you'd like to know what the dimensionality of your geometry is. And a data scientist way of figuring out the geometry of a space is to take a point in that space. In this case, this point corresponds to a particular uh, uh, jet or a particular event. And then ask, how many friends do you have as you uh, uh, zoom in and out of that point as a function of distance? So for example, uh, uh, in this room, we're roughly arranged in, in 2D. So if I take one of you in the, in the room and say, how many friends do you have as a, as, a, as a function of distance? The number of friends grows quadratically. So that means we're living in 2D. Um, if there were people below us in the, in the hall below and we were to do that, then you would realize that at a certain scale, once you got to the scale corresponding to the height of the room, you'd actually start, start seeing that these are 3D. Then as you start zooming out further, you get to a city and then the city is 2D again. And then when you zoom out further, you realize that you know, Florence, there's nothing around us. We just have like the city center and then you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the countryside. So the Florence eventually becomes uh, zero dimensional. And so that's the same thing happening here. We start at a high energy scale. At a high energy scale, all I have is something that's characterized by single quark or gluon jet configurations. So that's just a dot, zero dimensional. As I go down in scale, I'm starting to resolve emissions coming from the QCD parton shower. And the way that these, uh, 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 um, the way that this dimensionality grows depends on whether I'm looking at quarks or gluons, or if I'm looking at quarks and asking how many gluon neighbors does it have, this purple curve is somehow between the red and the, and the blue. This thing here is what a data scientist would call an intrinsic dimensionality or a correlation dimension. A QCD person would say, oh, this is like an anomalous dimension. And in that, indeed, if you look at the formula analytically for what this looks like, it does have um, the cusp anomalous dimension as, as one of the coefficients of, these, uh, of, of the, the slopes of these curves. And so this is a type of analysis which is synthesizing techniques for machine learning, but also doing interesting studies um, where the machine learning is, uh, is a tool in order to understand uh, features of high energy physics. And it's this kind of synthesis uh, that I think is going to be quite useful um, uh, to our field going forward. 
Okay, so let me stop there um, and just you know, wrap up this overview. Um, I guess I didn't change the slide here. So in the spirit of Snowmass or, or this, <laughs> this, this workshop, looking forward to your ideas and perspectives. But again, uh, high energy physics has been irreversibly impacted by this rise of deep learning. But it's not just deep learning, it's various analysis strategies. And I'm happy to talk to you more about other ones that my group has used. And this week, I hope we can talk about problems that you might be trying to, to solve. And can we translate that into a computational language where tools like machine learning or other related things could be useful? So let me stop there. Thank you. More questions? Do you ask it enough? A question, my friend. Oh, where is it? Please, just this time, only this time. Yeah. So you uh, talked about uh, incorporating things like infrared and collinear safety yeah. and respecting symmetries and uh, a lot of those things which make models more physical or respect physics more or our understanding of physics. To what extent, like, could you come up with, because uh, all of those things seem good to have, how many can you pile on to a single model of those sorts of constraints where you can have all of those nice properties or do you have to pick and choose which properties you're going to end up satisfying? Right. So let's first back up and ask, why do we want to do this? So one thing you mentioned is that for physical interpretability, you would like to do that. But if you have enough training data, then the machine could, in principle, learn all these features. If that's the real feature, if, you, if, your, if your system has a rotational symmetry and you show it enough examples and those examples have that rotational symmetry, the machine will eventually get there. Um, the word is though eventually. And so what you're doing here is you're baking in a kind of inductive bias into your problem by saying, I think that my, my answer will have this symmetry structure to it. Um, and therefore you can use less training data in order to achieve the same degree of performance if you're putting that inductive bias in there. So in what cases is it helpful to have the inductive bias? Well, it's helpful to do it if you, one, that you know it's true, <laughs> then you definitely want to put it in there, but that computationally it's worth it to put it in there because sometimes to get these symmetries in there, you, it actually costs you more computationally to make sure that you have that symmetry structure. So as I mentioned with this Lorentz equivariance, some of the initial approaches for in, uh, putting Lorentz symmetry in there were, were computationally expensive because you wanted to make sure you maintained all this Klebsch-Gordon-ology. More recent versions of this have actually been uh, shown to be more computationally efficient. And so there's a little bit of a trade-off between computational efficiency um, and uh, uh, and, and, and performance of the level of which you have that inductive bias that you have to take into account. In terms of being able to use all the symmetries all at the same time, sometimes they play very nicely together and sometimes they don't. Um, and an example of one which is really interesting uh, is how infrared and collinear safety plays with some of these other strategies. So infrared and collinear safety turns out to play very nicely with pairwise interactions. So uh, this is a, a paper that I should have written uh, three years ago, <laughs> still not written. Anyway, but you could show that it's really message passing that you can done in infrared and collinear safe way is, is, is very easy. However, infrared and collinear safety, if you wanna do things in the context of a hierarchical shower, like a hierarchical graph, that I, have, I do not know how to do that actually. Um, and so this is a case where this inductive bias that things should be hierarchical, which is motivated by QCD, and this inductive bias, the thing should be infrared and collinear safe, which is also motivated by QCD. Those things I do not know at the moment how to put them together. That either means that I'm just not clever enough, which is one possibility, or maybe there's an actual intrinsic tension between those, those two things. In that case, I don't know how to put them together at the same time. Uh, in most of the cases that I'm aware of, though, it, it is possible to synthesize multiple types of symmetry, and they're, apart from computational cost, there isn't that much of a, of a trade-off. The bigger trade-off is what if you be sure that that symmetry is relevant? For example, Lorentz symmetry, we have to be kind of careful when we say we wanna have something that has Lorentz symmetry because 
if you're in a collider environment, a fixed center of mass collision energy, then it's not true that everything is Lorentz invariant. You're only seeing things at one center of mass collision energy. And so there actually is a preferred frame, namely the lab frame. So in this case, maybe you don't want to actually enforce the equivariance, but maybe you just want to have a penalty term in your loss function that has an explicit regularization to drive you towards a more symmetric solution. And so it may be actually relaxing some of those symmetry assumptions may be, may be valuable. Um, I mean, there's, there's more we can say about that, but, but there, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of work on this. What I would like to see more work on is incorporating ideas like symmetries into the choice of loss functions that we don't actually play around with the loss functions as much as we should. And I think we should be thinking a little bit more about explicit regularization as one example of things where instead of building an architecture to have something explicit, let's have something exactly having loss functions that in, in, enforce it approximately um, such that we have a chance of, of letting the machine teach us if it happens to be symmetry breaking that we need to uh, be aware of. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yeah. Um, I, so you said that it's not necessarily going to, well, it will eventually get to the right answer. Yeah. I just wonder, is it possible that it might not eventually get to the right answer, even if you gave it a long time, because it might go down a different path to solving the problem, which might not have any, which might optimize in ways which just are like don't converge to something which is reliable or physically consistent or might it be that you need right. those inductive biases in order to structure or like guide right if if your likelihood ratio here has the symmetry then asymptotically you will learn it okay now when you say asymptotically it may be that you'll you that the, the scaling is such that you can't get there um so you, you have to be careful uh, in, 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 that, in that sense. So it may be, for example, that the scaling, uh, like, like normally when we, when we, when we have scalings, like you say, if I have n examples that you should approach that like one over n, well, it may be that you approach it really, really slowly, you know, one over n to some, some fractional power. Um, and in which case, you know, in, in practice, you never find it. In that case, the inductive bias gives you a better answer um, than, than you would have given that finite training data. And so it, that's another thing that probably we need to study more is, is that, that asymptotically, like what do we really mean? And then actually going back to this, this like to, to our statistics friends and ask like, how fast do I converge? Um, and uh, I was telling you that there was an example of, of machine learning loss functions that are non-local. And there's a cool example of a non-local Lagrangian that actually converges faster with finite training data than the local version of it for a particular task that you might want to do. And I would have never come up with that because I would have been stuck with this type of form. Uh, but the statisticians came up with came up with that, and it looks really weird. The loss function uh, in our language, in their language, it looks very natural. Uh, Follow up on the on the ensemble method because that's that's something that transgresses the the, the notion of of an in, event. Uh, yeah. In your answer to the previous question, you seem to imply that the uh, uh, Newman Pearson, uh, you, you evaluated uh, what should you be doing? Uh, go to the local likelihood, but um, then you and then you you use it as a reason to say um, one should use classical observables. But uh, Newman Pearson that should be evaluated on on the whole data set. I mean, not not on not on the event. But if you do that on the whole data set, I think you need an extra piece of the argument because uh, there should be a there should be a local likelihood on the ensemble level. Yeah. Right. So um, so I, I have a, a paper about this uh, okay. that that tries to explain this precise issue. Okay. So so it's confusing, right? So I so name and Pearson is for individual like classification decisions, right? And you would say, wait, shouldn't I do name and Pearson on the whole ensemble? That's right. But- <laughs> I mean, there is- Yeah. The push of yeah, exactly. But um, collider events are IID, so they're independent, identically distributed. That's right. So the log likelihood of an ensemble is just the sum over the likelihoods of each individual entity times the Poissonian on the total number of is and, and as long as you do and as long as you do that correctly 
yeah. then the thing that you machine learn on a single object is still is still the the the, the best you can do i understand because it doesn't see the normalization of, yeah. of the whole of the whole it, it, yeah this part i understand uh okay you're, you're implying that there is nothing uh there's nothing else to it in this ensemble. The, 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 well there's nothing else to it except our ability to theoretically predict yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The 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 probability density. So this is this is another way of 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 flipping things around. You can say, hey, instead of saying I want to find the optimal observable this way, what if I instead say I want to define the optimal observable in the context of doing um let's say an order by order expansion in the strong coupling constant or in the context of a resum calculation yeah. what is the thing that i'd want to do and the reason why you might be able to get away from this logic uh if you're doing an expansion is that when you take a probability density and you do a series expansion and truncate it it's no longer a probability density because you can have negative values mm -hmm. and so i don't actually know what the best answer is when you're in a situation where you're doing an expansion and so it may be that in the context of an expansion there may be event by event correlations that may be relevant um okay. that one might be able to use for example if i want to try to extract the value of alpha s or extract the value of the top quark mass those might be aided in a context where i have a trunk where i'm trying to compare to a theory calculation that has some truncation okay. but without truncation if you had the perfect answer theory then 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 you want to have one number per event and then you want to do the likelihood of the ensemble of those one numbers and there's nothing better that you can do okay so what one more follow up if I, yeah, if I yeah. Uh, what, what you, all, all the things you said happen all the time in, in uh, standard model effective theory you, you cut off you no longer have a probability distribution mm -hmm. after the linear term you need to go to the good writing um i i found it interesting that the ensemble methods are sensitive uh, to changes uh to 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 start to, to the Smith changes in the hadronic decays of boosted weak, uh, boosted weak uh, 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 bosons. We, we had even an excess in CMS in 2015, if, if those people remember, it's around, I believe, 1.5 TV or so. Mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing. Um, so if I, if I understand what you're saying, what we should be doing is using maybe traditional uh, graph neural nets training on the likelihood ratio in the chat tagging I'm, I'm talking about the drone example state specifically everything else we can we can rather rather well do but those smith effects in the hadronic final states have not been teased out as far as i know with uh, particle net graph neural nets or whatever so that would be in your opinion the optimal strategy because the assumption is not going to Good. it's not going to give me an edge over Ooh. atlas in my case huh but maybe maybe then. So, so, so there's a bunch of things to, to to unpack there. So so one thing is that what I just said, strictly speaking, is for A B hypothesis testing. So if I have one option, another option. It, it's always A B hypothesis testing. Right, but but, but <laughs> right, right. So well, if we say with parameterized B. So if you're doing A B pi, if if your goal in life is to have one thing that you measure, and then you interpret that. And you don't want to change what you do the measurement on and you want to average across performance across a wide range of b's uh, of alternative hypotheses then it may be actually preferential to take a suboptimal observable for one parameter point in order to get something that's better for all values and so it may be that for example let's assume i'm not that person okay <laughs> i rather want to i rather want to have the optimal hypothesis test for specific yeah. Point in Smith parameter space. Yeah. So very specific. Yeah. 0.1 yeah. certain parameter. Okay. Yeah. The, the, then, then, then that's just maybe hypothesis test. And the best thing you can do is is the likelihood ratio. Even when you have the ensemble, as long as you sum all the likelihood ratios as your test statistic. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
Good. Okay, so what we showed was that there is a class of jet algorithms. Well, okay, good. <laughs> Optimal transport can be used in a variety of different ways. One way is to show an exact mapping between something that you can do in the optimal transport land and what's something you can do in traditional land. So the, the algorithm that corresponds to projecting down to n-particle manifolds, the, that algorithm is one that I happened to develop on the slide, uh, yeah, in 2015, uh, a 2015 algorithm that I developed not knowing anything about optimal transport. And it turns out that that algorithm, it's a particular type of cone algorithm called X cone. That one is literally an optimal transport problem. Okay. Then you can say, okay, let's say I don't want to do that optimal transport problem. Let's say I want to approximate that optimal transport problem. Then you can ask of the classic jet clustering algorithms, which one does the best job approximating an optimal transport algorithm? And it turns out that KT jet clustering and Cambridge Aachen jet clustering, those can be uh, described as certain types of optimal transport problems, which don't do the full projection down to this one manifold, but actually do a kind of iterative projection. But when you do that projection, if you, if you know the language of recombination schemes, you have to do KT and Cambridge Aachen with a very specific recombination scheme for it to be an optimal transport uh, algorithm to correspond exactly to an optimal transport algorithm. Anti-KT, interestingly, does not have an optimal transport interpretation to the best that we could figure it out. So that's a case where that's a clustering algorithm whose behavior doesn't seem to be optimal transportified, which makes it interesting. So this is not to say that every algorithm can, has an optimal transport uh, uh, version, but what it then does suggest, once you look at the optimal transport version, it does suggest, oh, maybe this is the thing that I would like to do as a potential replacement for, for anti-KT or something else. Um, and, uh, and, and we're starting to explore some of those. So, uh, for example, let's say your goal in life is not to find a transport to this manifold where the manifold is defined by N vectors, but let actually say what you want to do is you want to find a manifold defined not by N vectors, but by N Gaussians. And you actually want to have like a Gaussianized version of your jet finding. That's something that you can very easily do, at least in principle, with optimal transport. Or maybe you say, oh, what it really is, it's I really have endpoints, a couple of ellipses, and then uniform pileup contamination, and I want to learn all those things. In that case, you can fuse optimal transport with gradient descent learning and actually learn the closest approach point on that manifold using this kind of parameterized uh, uh, energy flow distributions. Um, so there's, there's interesting things that one could in principle do. Uh, for me, it's surprising that certain one of these algorithms have exact mappings. Certain ones have approximate mappings to optimal transport, and then certain ones don't have an optimal transport interpretation. So this example of this energy energy correlators doesn't seem to have an optimal transport language, even though it's based on the same primitive object. It doesn't seem to be naturally done in an optimal transport picture. OK. okay so. Thank you, Jesse, for giving like very clear message that there is really almost actually one wonders what is theoretical phenol, okay, or yeah. theoretical physics about if not about machine learning. Yeah. After your, <laughs> so what else? So I guess yeah, you agree that there is a lot of stuff. So we can thank him again. Yeah, thank you.